Good morning and welcome to Real Life Ministries. We are stoked that you are joining us this morning. Everyone's coming in, finding their seats, getting settled. But before we get started, I would love to uh, know where you're watching from. We love getting to connect with you all throughout the week. Um, so you can drop that in the chat. If you have any questions or prayer requests, you can drop those in the chats as well. Um, or email us at info at reallifeministries.com. I don't know about you, but fall is well on its way. It is raining here in Post Falls and a little chilly. And so we are uh, breaking out our coats and jackets and boots. And so we are ready for that fall weather. Don't forget, if you're new here, make sure you download our Real Life Ministries app. We've got a ton of stuff happening all throughout the week. And the app is the best way for you to stay connected. It has a place to give, your sermon notes, past sermon series. Um, and if you make a decision today, you can do that right on the app. So make sure it's downloaded and ready to go before we get started. We are wrapping up our sermon series, Controversial. It has been an awesome series in diving into some hard topics and conversations, but it has been really, really good. Gabe Cleave, our new Hayden campus pastor, is here bringing the word, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say this morning. Don't forget, we also have a podcast along, um, going along with this sermon series this year. And so if you have questions um, from today's sermon or even past sermons, you can email us at info at reallifeministries.com. And we're gonna be answering some of those questions on that podcast. You can check out the podcast on our website, reallifeministries.com. And as always, again, I'm gonna encourage you, we would love to meet you in person. If you are local, we wanna meet you in person. Come visit our campus, get connected. And this Tuesday, we have what we call our new groups kicking off. We are a small groups church. We wanna be in relationship with each other. And this is a great place to start. You're gonna join a group with a bunch of other new people. So you're not the only new person. So it's gonna be this Tuesday, 6.30. Dinner and childcare is provided on this Tuesday. Um, so if you have questions, questions, make sure you check out the website or the app and you can register right there online. All right, you guys, the Hayden Campus worship team is going to be coming up on stage, which means we've got to get off the stage. Make sure you grab your Bible, a cup of coffee, and thank you for joining us.
Good morning, real life. How's everybody doing this morning? All right, 8 8 a.m. crowds alive, I love it. Hey, welcome to Real Life. We're super excited that you're here this morning. Uh, Before we get going too too much further, I wanna let you know about our app. If you don't have our app yet, it's the best way to stay engaged with what's going on here at Real Life. Not only here in Post Falls, but we actually now have the Hayden campus on there. So Hayden campus is getting ready to start and we're able to see that we're a real church because we're on an app now. And so uh, just invite you, if you haven't had a chance yet to do that, to go ahead and do that. Uh, Also wanna invite you to just spend some time today over the next hour we're gonna spend in worship. Just engage your hearts right now. I know that all of us come from different spots this week and different opportunities that we've had, but today is a, a, is a moment in time that we can just slow down, we can reflect on all that Jesus has been doing in our lives, and we can celebrate him today. Can we do that this morning? All right, we'll go ahead and stand up. We're gonna, we're gonna get this whole thing started with some prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for your presence in our lives. And God, as we just pause to worship you today, to spend time just pouring our hearts out in thanksgiving to you, God, we pray that you would meet us today. You would meet each of us right where we're at as we celebrate you and what you're doing. God, we thank you and we give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my team Till I met I was breathing but not All my failures I tried to hide It was my team Till I met you You called my name And I this morning, our story with Christ. So sing it out with me. I needed a rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I
The psalmist writes, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? You rule raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Our shield belongs to the Lord.
nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. good to see you all this morning and the hard thing is is from up here we can't really see exactly who you are but we would love for you to grab your phone and send a text to us to let you know that let us know that you're here so if you're here joining us in post falls grab your phone text here to the number up on the screen if you're joining us online we would love to know that as well text online to the number on your screen and if you're new here man we really want to say thanks for being here this morning can we give it up for all those who are new yes and if you're new here, we would love to get to know you as well. So you can text NEW to the number on the screen, and you could also come out to the lobby. We've got kiosk, and we would love to know that you're here this morning. We'd love to give you a gift for being here and just invite you to come back and get to know a little bit more about us as we get to learn more about you. So if you're new, we'd love to do that with you. Uh, hey, for those of you who are also new to groups, see that transition there? Uh, new to groups, we've got new groups starting this Tuesday night. And you can text groups to the number that's gonna be on the screen. So if you have not yet connected with the group, this is your opportunity to be connected. And really when we connect with a group, we're connecting and we're doing life together. It's an opportunity for us to grow together into spiritual maturity through relationship with those around us. And so if you're an existing group, this is not necessarily for you, but if you're new to groups or new this year to groups, please join us for that, you won't be sorry, it's an awesome opportunity to grow together in Christ. And so um, please do that. They're also out in the kiosk, you'll see a bunch of, there's actually a ton of candy out there, so the 8 a.m. need a little sugar, go out there and visit them in the kiosk as well. Well, speaking of giving, I know I was giving candy out there. Speaking of giving in here, is, is right now it's our opportunity to give. And as we give back to the Lord, we gotta recognize that everything we have is His. And so we have a few different ways that you can give. You can get online and go to reallifeministries.com and then backslash give. You can use the app that we spoke about this morning. You can give through that. And for those of you who prefer to have cash or checks, we've got giving uh, boxes in the back at each door. And really giving is a way of saying that we trust God with his resources more than we trust ourselves. And it's also a way that we see ministry done here and throughout our community and throughout the world is through your generosity in giving. And so please take time to do that this morning. One thing that we love to celebrate around here, and if you've been with us any time at all, you know this. Last week we had seven people make a decision for the Lord and be baptized publicly. Yes. See, baptism is a picture of us dying to our old selves and being raised to new life in Christ. And not only did we see seven last week, but we have seven people this week uh, in the coming services that are gonna be baptized as well. And so really, this comes through the community that they're around, the, the groups that they're a part of, and they're doing life together, taking their next steps together. And so if you have questions about baptism, and you say, man, I wanna know more about that, or it's time for me to get baptized, please let one of us know, because we would love to walk that, walk that out with you and see you come to a spot of recognizing the importance of being baptized. And so please find us today. Well, I'm excited because I get to introduce my friend and the new Hayden Campus pastor, Gabe Cleave, this morning. 
Yes. He's going to be coming out in just a few minutes. And I really believe that God has put a word in his heart for us today. And so will you continue our time of worship? Open up your heart to allow God to do what he wants to do in you today. I'm going to pray and then we're going to welcome Gabe. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word that's alive and active. God, we just pray that today you would meet us right where we're at. That you would speak clearly to us, God. That we would have an opportunity to leave here differently than we came. So God, encourage us this morning, convict us, engage, and allow us to just reflect on your goodness during this time. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. morning. Well, maybe you noticed a, a few uh, different faces up here, some new faces. This was our Hayden Campus worship team. How awesome did they do? So good. We're so excited. We're, we're stoked about our Hayden Campus and these guys leading in worship each week and Wayne, our associate pastor up here hosting. We got Joe Hansen mixing sound back there, making everything just sound awesome. And so uh, I am just blessed. I'm honored. I am just excited to be a part of this team. Uh, speaking of the Hayden Campus, I have a lot of people asking, hey, when is this thing starting? Where's it going to be? What's going on? What are the details? So here you go. You ready? Write this down. Here it is. On October 3rd, we are launching our very first Hayden Campus service. Is that exciting or what? But this month, this month on September 26th, we're launching all of our groups. So we have like 20 plus groups that we're launching into the Hayden community, in and around the Hayden community. And then on October 1st, we're launching youth ministry. The 3rd of October, our very first service. Here's where we're starting. We're starting in the Hayden Anthem Church Building on Sunday evenings, and for October, November, and December, we're doing the first Sunday of the month, and then come January, we'll reevaluate to go, hey, we, we're looking to go uh, weekly at that point. And so right now, first Sunday of the month, starting on October 3rd in the Hayden Anthem Building. And if you want any more details about groups, youth ministry, or services, go to reallifeministries.com slash Hayden, and it gives you all the details about our campus. So there you go, you're caught up. If you have any other questions, you can let me know, but we're just super excited to get going with it. Hey, so we are gonna uh, jump into the last sermon of this series, controversial, that, that we've been in for the last few weeks. And, um, you know, people have been asking, you know, why are, we, why are we doing this series? You know, it's not like we have a bunch of controversial topics going on in our society right now. <laughs> what, what are we doing this for? There's no, like, polarizing conversations we're having. Obviously, you know, I'm joking. There's a lot of conversations that we're having that are very controversial, right? A lot of conversations that we're having that are, uh, that are, that are polarizing. And that's exactly what's happening in, this, in these conversations that are taking place right now. They're, they're polarizing us. And it's not just polarizing like society and church. It's actually polarizing people within the church as well. And what we're forced to do is we're actually forced to make a decision. You're either on this side or you're on this side. And if you're on this side, then you're against me. You're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground anymore. You either agree with me or you're against me. And that's just kind of where these conversations have led to. It's led to division. It's led to animosity. It's led to frustration. And it's led to resentment against the other side. And so we're faced with this decision of going, which side do I choose? Do I stay here or do I stay here? What's truth? What's not truth? Where do I go? Where do I not go? How do I engage in this conversation? And as a church, here's why we're not doing this, this series. We're not doing it to say, this is the right side to choose. We're not saying you need to choose this side or this side. We're saying you need to do what Jesus says. It's not about which side you choose, it's about what does scripture say about these conversations. So this is the reason as a church we're addressing these things is to go, hey, listen, whatever side you end up on, as long as it's in alignment with God's 
word. So we have a resource page that we've been pointing people to. It's, it's on our app, it's on the website. There's all different kinds of resources. You can go and, and, and get on there and some different books and some different uh, uh, things to read. And, and there's a podcast that we've been doing and we've been uh, asking people to send questions in uh, to, this, uh, to this podcast that we've been answering questions at the end of the series. And so if there's questions that you have, you can just go to info at reallifeministries.com and send in some questions. Uh, But we wanna be able to engage in this conversation. So where we've been so far, just a quick recap, is week one, Jim opened this series up, and this has been the red thread through the entire series. He opened this conversation up by saying, God's word is the final authority in our life. Now, some of you may think, okay, well, why is that controversial? And the reason is not so much because society disagrees with that. Society, the secular world, has always disagreed with that. The reason it comes in as controversial is because within the church, Christians are now disagreeing with that. Christians are saying, you know what? God's word was good for when it was written. The Bible was good for, but now it's outdated. We've progressed as a society. Some of those things don't apply to us anymore. It's not culturally relevant anymore. So therefore, there are certain passages, certain scriptures, certain words, certain concepts, ideologies that are in scripture that don't apply to us anymore. So therefore, we don't have to listen to what God's word says on these certain topics. And as Real Life Ministries, we wholeheartedly disagree with that. And we are saying God's word is God's word. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is the final authority in our life. Yesterday, today, and forever. And we stand upon the truth of God's word in every single thing that we do. Week two, we had uh, Christopher Yuan come in and he talked about the conversation of homosexuality. He was a gay man. He came out of the homosexual lifestyle. He shared his testimony and his story of how he came out with that and talked about his identity in Christ and how his identity and our identity shouldn't be in our sexuality. It shouldn't be in our gender. It shouldn't be in our race. It shouldn't be in our marital status. It shouldn't be in our parenting. It shouldn't be in our job. Our identity shouldn't be in any of those things. Our identity is firmly founded in who we are in Jesus. We are sons and daughters. We are children of the most high God. That is our identity. That's what we stand on. So week three, week three, Jim expounded on that conversation of sexuality, talked about God's design for sexuality. And uh, he expounded it to not just be about homosexuality, but he talked about transgenderism, talked about gender fluidity, and really brought it back to the heart of God and back to our identity in him. Week four, he talked about racism and critical race theory and uh, how that's prevalent in our society and our culture and what we as a church are gonna do about that and what we believe about that. And so those have been the topics so far. You know, some light, fluffy topics very feel-good topics, right? This week, uh, we're, uh, we're gonna jump into another topic, but uh, during this entire series, we've said this. We have got to be in the right fight. You guys, here's the, here's the reality is there's a fight going on. And we as followers of Jesus have to decide which fight we're going to engage in. And we wanna engage in the, the right fight, because there's a right fight to engage in. And so this passage in 2 Timothy has kind of guided how we're going to address this. 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26, it says this, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. So avoid silly arguments and fights. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife, they generate animosity, they generate tension. And a servant of the Lord, that's you and I, must not quarrel, we must not fight, but be gentle to who? To all, be gentle to all, able to teach, teach the truth, patient in humility, not out of pride, not out of arrogance, not out of we know more than you, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. And listen, this this part's really, really cool because we get to correct those who are in opposition. That's our part. But now this is the weight that's lifted off your and I's shoulders, ready? Correcting those who are in opposition. And if God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth, they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. See, this is our job as 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 a church, as followers of Jesus. We present truth. 
We have to understand what truth is through God's word, but then we present it in love, in humility, in patience. We don't fight, we don't argue, we don't Bible thump. We don't tell people they're, they're idiots for not understanding scripture, not believing scripture. We simply present truth, we do it in love, and then we let God take care of the rest. We aren't God, we aren't the Holy Spirit, we can't change hearts, we can't change minds. We are simply a vessel that God uses to present his truth, and then the Holy Spirit is the one who does the changing. Amen? Amen. So, we gotta be in the right fight. This week, we're talking about how we as a society, as we as a country, deal with poverty, people in need, the poor. How do we deal with that? Now, there's all different kinds of reasons and explanations of why this is an issue, why poverty exists, why there are poor people in society. There's all different kinds of, of explanations and, and different views on why this is, a, this is an issue. And there's even different reasons that people believe that, that, that people get themselves into poverty or why this happens. Or, or, and there's different explanations of what we need to do about it. There's all different kinds of reasons and people on different sides are saying, this is the reason, this is the reason, this is what we need to do about it, this is we need about it, but here's what we have to understand is regardless of what you believe about the issue, the issue exists. And as followers of Jesus, we don't turn a blind eye to this issue. This is a big deal. There are people in our country, in our world, in our state, in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our church that are struggling, that are hurting that are living paycheck to paycheck or even worse, can't pay their bills and are behind and can't afford to put food on, t on their table, can't aff afford to have the, the necessities that a human being needs. There are people that, that sleep out on the streets because they don't have a roof over their head. There are people within our church, our society, our city, our neighborhoods that are living in poverty. And this should grieve us. This should, like, we, as Christians, we shouldn't be okay with this. We shouldn't go, well, you know what? It doesn't really impact me. It doesn't affect me. I'm doing okay. I'm surviving. I'm making it. And so I'll just kind of deal with my family. And then, you know, they can kind of figure out what they, no, this, this, is, this grieves God. This is a big deal to God. So therefore, it's something that we should care about. This impacts us. It's important Many of us know people who are living in this reality, who can't afford certain things. That single mom raising four kids on welfare and food stamps in low income housing. That's my mom. That was my reality. That was my upbringing. Some of us know that person. Some of us have been a part of that. Maybe that's you now. And it's not just something that impacts our society and our culture, it's something that impacts the world around us. In fact, it impacts most of the world around us. I remember the first time I went on a missions trip, went down to Tecate, Mexico. And we went down there and, and uh, we, we were doing lots of service projects and, and ministering to the youth in this area and this, this little village in Tecate. And we'd come back from doing these service projects and we were tired and, and we were hot and we were hungry. And I remember this one day, it was like the third or fourth day we were there and, and we just got done digging some trenches and we came back and I was like, <laughs> ready? I was starving. And I remember going into the place that we were getting our food and, and I asked, I said, hey, what's, what's for dinner? I said, tonight we're having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I said, we're having what? We're having peanut butter and jelly? And guys, just being honest, I was mad. I was like, I've been working all day. I'm tired, I'm hungry, and you're gonna feed me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? I had such a bad attitude about this. I grabbed my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I went and sat on this brick wall over by the basketball court by myself, sulking in my misery. And this little boy comes and he just sits right next to me on the wall. This little Mexican kid and he was probably nine, 10, 11 years old and, and he just looked at me and he didn't want anything from me. These kids, all they, all they cared about was just being with people. He didn't ask me for anything, he just sat there and he, 
He smiled and he was, he was filthy dirty. His shoes were falling off of his feet because they were rotting off of his feet. His dirt underneath his fingernails, his, his teeth were rotting. He was filthy and he just looked at me and he had this smile on his face. I know a little bit of Spanish, so I just looked at him and I said, tiene de hambre, which means are you hungry? And he shook his head, he said yes. I said, te gusta, would you like, would you like this? He said yes, so I gave him this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I've never seen a kid be more thankful, more appreciative over a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my life. And I had to get up and I had to leave him for a second. I walked away and I just, I just bawled. I said, Lord, I am so sorry. I am so sorry for being so ungrateful for what I have. And the reality is, is this is a common story. This isn't just something I've experienced, it's probably something many of you have experienced. Poverty exists. The question is, what are we as a church, what are you as part of the church ready and willing to do about it? In America, we have two main ideologies that are set up to distribute wealth in our country and in turn addressing the poor, the needy in our society. That's called capitalism and socialism. And capitalism puts the responsibility on the individual to be an entrepreneur, a self-starter, to kind of control their destiny. You know, you work hard, you make money, you can start careers and start businesses and it's put on you. Put the responsibility is, is put on you. And, and, and capitalism, you know, it's the ability to make money by working hard and operating within a supply and demand free market economy. Where socialism puts the responsibility on the government to, to distribute as they see necessary the, the supplies, the goods, the, the resources of that society, of that country. Now, here's what we have to understand about, about socialism and communism, and neither one of these are biblical. Neither one of these are found in scripture, and both of these have pros and both of these have cons. Some pros and cons of, of, or some pros of capitalism is it produces personal responsibility, entrepreneurship, some pros of socialism is it values equality. Some cons of capitalism can foster greed and can value competition over compassion. Some cons of socialism is it can foster dependency, entitlement, and laziness. And again, neither one of these ideologies are biblical. Nowhere in scripture does it say if you're gonna found a country, if you're gonna be a successful nation, capitalism is the way to go or socialism is the way to go. But we believe, many of us here believe that there are more biblical principles tied to capitalism that make it the better of the systems that are set up within our country. But again, neither one of these are biblical. Neither one of these are godly in and of themselves. They only have godly principles attached to them. But despite all of that, despite whether you lean capitalistic or socialistic or wherever you go, you have, we have to maintain as followers of Jesus, it's not about living out capitalistic principles, it's about living out godly principles. See, the conversation shouldn't be red versus blue, left versus right, Democrat versus Republican or capitalist versus socialist. That should not be the conversation. If we're engaging in that conversation, we're fighting the wrong fight. The conversation should be, is it godly or is it worldly? Is it biblical or is it secular? Is it what God wants or is it not what God wants? This should be the conversation that we're having. Not this or this, but what's God say about it? Cal Thomas quoted this, in a free society, government reflects the soul of its people. If people want change at the top, they will have to live in different ways. Our major social problems are not the cause of our decadence, which means moral or cultural decline, they are a reflection of it. So here's what he's saying. If we wanna see change at the top, we have to live out that change. 
If we want to see something done about the problems in our society, we cannot say, well, as soon as they change it, as soon as they do something about it, as soon as government does this or government does that, or they do this or they do that, then the things will change. And so we have to set up a new system or a new ideology. No, it starts with the individual. It starts with the church. The church is the one that needs to make the difference in the society, therefore leading the charge and leading the way to the change that we want to see based on God's heart revealed in scripture. It starts with us. It doesn't start with them. And just as Jim talked last week about critical race theory, CRT, critical race theory, is a system that's set up to deal with racism. So it's not about tear down the system and establish a new one. It's going, God, tear down my, my heart. Create in me a new heart, oh God. Help me to start here, not out there. So instead of hoping the system will take care of it, we as Christians need to take care of it, but we have to look at what biblical principles are based on God's word that help us align with his word of how we're gonna deal with this issue. So we're gonna look at three biblical principles, and then at the end, we're gonna talk about how do we actually engage in the right fight. So biblical principle number one is we value others. We value others as followers of Jesus. All of us were made in the image of God, therefore giving all of us infinite value and infinite worth. This is called imago dei. This this means we are all created in the image of God. And in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, it says this. God created man and woman in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, God created all of us in his image. Male, female, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, socialist, capitalist, Middle class, upper class, poor, wealthy, all of us were created in the image of God. Therefore, every single person that's ever been born in the history of mankind has been given infinite value and infinite worth regardless of their socioeconomical status, regardless of of how much money they have in their bank account. All of us have been given infinite value and worth. We are all on the same playing field. So therefore, when we look at people through the eyes of God, we see the very inerrant worth and value that they have in them because they were created in his image. And because we see them that way, we see this equality within us. We don't look at someone who has less than us and say, well, they're just, they're lower than me because they don't have as much as I do. Galatians chapter three, Paul says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He's saying we're all the same in value. See, people will take this scripture and they'll take it out of context. And they'll say, see, Paul was doing away with gender. There's no longer gender. See, there's no longer male nor female. This is, this is, this is what someone that, that, that is an advocate for the gender fluidity conversation will point to. Neither male nor female. This isn't a, 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 a verse about distinguishing between genders. This is a verse, a value verse. See, all three examples that Paul gives right here He's saying this is a value verse. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Back in the day, the Jews valued themselves over Gentiles. They said Gentiles are are low. They're scum of society. And he's saying, no, just because you're a Jew does not mean a Gentile is not as valuable as you are. Back then, females weren't considered as valuable as males. So he's saying, men, don't devalue females. They're just as valuable as you. Slave or free, boss or employee. You're not any better because you have employees. Stop treating your employees like they're garbage. This is a value verse. We're all equal in Christ. James says something similar. He says this in James chapter two, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting, your church gathering, comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? 
Now, maybe that doesn't happen in this specific environment. Like someone walks in and we make them go sit on the floor or tell them to go sit up in the bleachers or whatever that is. But does it happen anywhere else in your life? Is there a neighbor that you have that you're less fond of because maybe they don't have as much to offer you? Where in your life do you see discrimination leaking out? He goes on, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal laws found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. We don't treat people like they're on different playing fields. We love them because they're in error value their inerrant worth, which then leads to biblical principle number two. If we can see people through the eyes of God and see their, inerrant, their, their value and their worth, their intrinsic value and worth, then it, it causes us to love them. If we value them the way that Christ does, then we will in, eventually love them. Now, here's what we have to understand is love isn't just some feeling that we wake up and we just go, oh man, I feel so much compassion or, or so much, you know, uh, uh, just, I just want to be with this person all the time. Love is an action. Love is something that we do. Love is a verb. When we look at 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. It's gentle, it's not rude. It doesn't hold records of wrongs. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It always perseveres, it always hopes, it never gives up, it never fails. All these things are actions. These are things that we actually do. So how does valuing people actually lead us to action to love them? to actually do something about the poor, the needy in our society and in our culture. Philippians 2.3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now, we just talked about valuing people and how we're on the same playing field. But if I actually value you more than I value myself, it's gonna cause me to treat you differently. It's gonna cause me to actually want to help you and give you, and be generous to you, and, and be a part of what's going on in your world. This will lead me to action. How would that change the way that we interact with people? We actually treated them as if they were better than us. Now, to love does not always mean that I have to give you what you want, but maybe it does mean that I'm gonna be part of giving you what you need. How can I come alongside that person in my neighborhood who's struggling, that person in my family who's, who's working hard but barely scraping by. That person in the church, that single mom, that single dad. That person who, is, who can't afford groceries. How can we as a church come alongside those people and be a part of the solution? So we can't simply just say, okay, I value you and I, and I love you, but I'll do nothing about it. This leads us to action. Church, what is that supposed to lead us to? How are we playing a part as the church in helping poor, helping needy, helping the people that live in poverty within our own community? How are we playing a part in that? Acts 2 tells us when the church got started, this is what they did. It says they sold everything and they gave to those in need. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you gotta go home and you gotta sell everything you have and just give away all your possessions to those in need because then you would be that person in need. And then we'd have to come and help you, right? So there's this balance, right? You don't just give away everything you have, but you surely don't just hoard everything you have. What's the balance? Let's not polarize this conversation and say it's either this or this, but what does God say about this? God talks about being generous. God talks about being a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave he loved the world so much that he gave. What did he give? He gave everything. He gave it all. He valued us above himself. And he came and he gave. How are we playing a part in doing what God has called us to do? Now, the conversation then turns into this, because many of you are thinking this. Okay, well, if I just give to every single person who has a need, where does that stop? Won't this lead to entitlement? Won't this lead to, to, to uh, them being entitled to everything that we have? Let's talk about entitlement for a second because entitlement is a two-sided coin. And on one side of the coin, entitlement says this, I deserve your money because I'm valuable, because I, I have this inerrant worth and value, this intrinsic value that God has placed in me. Because I have that, well, I deserve your money. You have more money than I do, so you should help me out. You should give me some of your money. I deserve your money. That's one side of the coin. 
But let's talk about the other side of the coin that's not talked about as much. And that's this, I deserve my money. I've worked hard. I've earned this money. I've worked at my company for 30 years and never taken a day off. And you young bucks, you don't even know what working hard is like. Because back in my day, I had to travel to work uphill both ways in the snow without shoes at $2 an hour. And I didn't get vacation days and go get your butt working in a sawmill and in the coal mines. And then you'll know what hard work is. I deserve my money. Some of the younger kids are going, what's a coal mine? <laughs> a sawmill? What is, what is that? Is that on YouTube somewhere? <laughs> See, that's a two-sided coin, right? I deserve your money and I deserve my money. But again, let's not polarize this conversation. Let's not say it's either this or this. How about this? How about we look at it from a biblical perspective? Instead of I deserve yours or I deserve mine, how about it's all God's and I have to manage it how he calls me to? How about that? How about everything that I have, God's given me? And I have an obligation and responsibility as a follower of Jesus to manage my finances in the way that honors God, in the way that he calls me to manage it. Now, are we enabling or are we helping? Well, that's the conversation you're gonna have to answer for yourself. But if I'm gonna lean too far to one way, I'm gonna lean towards being too giving. At least that's what I wanna do. I don't wanna to lean towards being too stingy. I wanna to lean towards being too good. Well, you might enable people. Okay, I don't wanna enable people just to be lazy, but I surely don't wanna be stingy and hoard everything. At the end of the day, when I face God, I hope he says, Gabe, you are too generous. Not you are too stingy. So, third biblical principle. So first, we, we, lo- we value people we love people, and then the third biblical principle, we work hard. As followers of Jesus, we work hard, we're hard workers. We were created to work. We were placed in the garden to work. That's what Adam's job, I mean, Adam's job was to cultivate the garden. Go and name animals, go and cultivate the garden, go and plant other trees, and go and take care of all that I've given you. See, work is not a result of sin. Not enjoying work is a result of sin. We were created to work and work hard. And many of us go to our jobs and we go, man, I just can't stand my job. It's a result of sin or a poor career choice. (laughs) Do something about it. You're not stuck there. So we work hard. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. You don't work, you don't eat. That's taken out of context. You're not willing to work, you don't eat. See, it's not, you know, you, you, you might go, well, well the, you know, the people that just, they, they, they refuse to work, those are the ones that, yeah, and many of you are going, that, that's my teenager right now, right? Like, not willing to work. Guess what? Don't feed them. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, do you have a job yet? No. What's for dinner? Nothing. <laughs> go get a job but only McDonald's is hiring. Yeah, like $37 an hour now. (laughs) Go get a job. You're not willing to work. You don't eat. Well, they're gonna starve. No, they won't. They're like 15 pounds. They got enough there. Like, go get, kids, you might go, I'm not old enough to work. Mow the lawn. Pick up your clothes. Do the dishes. You can get a job. Tell your parents, say, hey, mom, dad, I'll mow the lawn for $3 per stripe. I don't know. (laughs) You can negotiate that, but we can all, we're called to work. We're called to work and work hard. 1 Timothy 5, 18, for scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. The worker deserves his wages. It's good to make money. It's okay to make money. It's okay to make money and it's okay to make a lot of money. But here's the question that you have to ask yourself. What is your why? Why? Why do you want to make money? See, I believe that the process you go through to come to a conclusion is just as important as the conclusion you come to, if not more. You can say, I want to make a lot of money, and that's okay. But if you say, so that 
I can have a bigger house and a nicer car and fancier clothes and a cushion in my savings and, and all of these different worldly things, then I think that your why is off. But if you say, I wanna make money because I actually wanna give. I, I don't just care about in, you know, increasing my standard of living, I actually in, care about increasing my standard of giving. And I wanna provide for my family and I wanna be able to have margin in my budget to help that person down the street. And I wanna be able to help that poor person in our church and that single mom or that single dad. I wanna be able to help when I see a need. If that's your why, I think God will honor that. If that's your why, I think God will bless that. If that's your why, I think God says, here is a person after my heart who cares about people, who actually values people, who loves people, who's gonna do something about this issue, who about this thing in our society that we need something about. If that's your why, I think God will bless you in that pursuit. But if your why is simply selfish, I don't think God's gonna bless that. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. My wife and I, we, for years, we've had a generosity fund that we put a certain percentage of our, of our each paycheck into. And whenever we see a need, whether it's in our life group, in our neighborhood, in our church, and even across the world, we're able to say, you know what? We've created margin in our budget to be able to pull $5, $50, $500 out and say, we wanna bless. And please don't hear me, I'm not bragging about that, I'm not, but this is something that we have been determined to do is create margin in our budget to where we can help when we see a need. Do you have a generosity fund? Do you have margin in your budget to where when there's a need, you can meet it? Or are you so strapped that you've left yourself unable to help when there's a need? Maybe it starts with taking $10 out of each paycheck and putting it in a fund. Maybe 1%. Maybe you can go, hey, you know what? I'll do 5%. But have you positioned yourself in a way that you can help when the need comes? Now you might think, man, this is so overwhelming because there's so much need. Where do I start? And do I send to the, the starving kids over in India or do I, do I support a, 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 a local charity or an orphanage? Or like, where do I start with this? Andy Stanley says this, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. We exist to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. So you know how we're gonna be a part of the solution of dealing with poor, needy, and poverty? One person at a time. Who's that one person in your life right now that you can say, you know what? I'm gonna buy groceries for that person this week. I'm gonna drop a Walmart gift card in their mailbox anonymously this week. As we conclude this series, there's, there's a story that I, 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 I wanna tell out of, out of 2 Kings chapter six. And, and I just think of all these different things that are going on in our society right now, in our culture right now, and it seems overwhelming. It seems like, okay, we have critical race theory and we have homosexuality and we have gender fluidity and we have uh, racism and we have all these different things. We have the poor, we have the needy, we have poverty, we have all these different things. We have the attack against scripture, all these things in our culture and in our society and even within our church that are just like, it seems overwhelming. And what do we do? Is Satan winning? Is the enemy winning? Is he actually taking ground? And there's this story in 2 Kings that I think just sums up this perfectly. Elisha and his servant are sitting in this valley and they're about ready to be attacked by the king of Syria because Elisha keeps on revealing to the king of Israel the secrets of the king of Syria. And so he goes, go and kill that prophet. And so he sends hundreds of chariots and hundreds of horses and hundreds of soldiers to surround Elisha and his servant in this valley. And it looks like there's no way out. It looks like the enemy is winning. And Elisha's servant comes out that morning and he looks at the hills and he, they're surrounded all around him. They're surrounded, overwhelmed. And Elisha's servant starts freaking out. He's like, my Lord, they're, they're all around us. What are we gonna do? And in the text it says, and the man of God, meaning Elisha, simply says this, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Open his eyes. Church, I think we're blinded sometimes. 
to the reality of what's around us. We see the, the, the human armies around us. We see the physical attacks against us. I think we're blinded to the reality. And Elisha just says, open his eyes so that he may see. And in that moment, the servant's eyes were open. And you know what he saw around the human armies? He saw the armies of God. Chariots of fire, horses of fire, surrounding the armies of the human king. And God in that moment was saying, Elisha, your servant, he doesn't understand, he doesn't see. He sees all the physical around him. He sees the chaos around him going to attack him, looking like it's gonna overtake him, but no weapon against you will prosper. Those who are for me will not be against me. I have overcome, I have won, and I will open your eyes to the reality around you that I have overcome all of what you see and you need only to be still and open your eyes and realize that I am in control. I have been all along and I always will be and you will defeat the enemies. Church, our job is to simply just go, God, open our eyes. Help me to fight the right fight. Help me to engage in it the way that you want me to. In your sermon notes, I, there's, some, there's some homework that I, I want you guys to, to, to look into doing this week. If you have your sermon notes, open those up. If we are soldiers of Christ, if we are soldiers of God, we are called to engage in the right fight. But how do we do that? Well, every time a soldier goes into battle, they need to, they need to gear up, they need to put their armor on. Ephesians chapter six tells us what our armor is. And in there, I wrote out this, I'm gonna challenge you this week, every single day before you engage in the fight, before you engage in the battle, I want you to put on your armor. I want you to pray on your armor. And I just wrote out a prayer in there that you can pray each, each day before you start your day, before you engage in this battle. Pray on the armor of God. Pray on the helmet of salvation to protect your mind, to remind yourself that you are saved through the blood of Jesus. Pray on the, breast, the breastplate of righteousness to remember that God has called you to be righteous and holy and set apart. Pray on the shield of faith that will extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Pray on the belt of truth to keep you rooted and grounded in his word. Pray on the feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel that no matter where you go, no matter what fight you engage in, you bring the gospel with you, you represent Jesus to a lost and dying world. Pray on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take it with you wherever you go and ask God to remind you of his words as you engage in battle because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. That's what our fight is against. It's not against right, it's not against left, it's not against socialist, capitalist, it's not against Republican or Democrat, it's not against any of those things. That's the fight the enemy wants us to get into. But we as a church will be bound and determined to fight the right fight is against the enemy of the evil forces. It is against the spiritual realms. But church, open your eyes, put on the armor and go face the battle with the God of angels armies on your side. We can do this. And if we value people, if we love people and we work hard, I think we're just crazy enough to make a dent in this issue that we see in our culture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for valuing us. Thank you for giving us the ability to express your love to those around us. And God, I just pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would empower us and strengthen us and encourage us to love other people through giving, through helping, through serving. God, show us as a church how you want us to do this. Show us individually what part we play, whether it's with a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, someone in this church. God, who can we love? Who can we support? Who can we show compassion to within our own church? Strengthen us and empower us through your Holy Spirit. God, open our eyes to see the battle around us that we would see that you are surrounding us. You are surrounding us, God, and you win. Jesus, we love you, and it's your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We will be continuing communion and finishing our service in just a moment. We pray today's service was challenging, encouraging, and motivational. We hope you'll visit one of our three campuses soon. We'd love to meet you in person and give you and your family a small gift of appreciation. For more information about Real Life, upcoming events, and connecting with our community, please visit reallifeministries.com. Come join us and help us impact our community, our nation, and the world for Jesus, one person at a time.
midst of our need, Jesus reached out to us. He may have used people in your life to walk alongside of you, to spend time sharing with you the love of Christ. See, we are all saved from something for something. Right now, we're gonna have the opportunity to lift up the people that we know that we're in relationship with that are needy. Maybe it's a physical need and God's asking you to meet it. Maybe it's a spiritual need and they need to understand who Jesus is and the power of forgiveness. Whoever those people are that the Lord is bringing to your heart right now, let's spend a moment and pray for them. the bread and the cup that we hold in our hands today. Symbolically represent Jesus's body and his blood. Was given for each of us. Not so that we would just have another 20 or 30 years of a good life here, but so that we could experience eternal life. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and after he gave thanks he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's remember him today. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the, represents the new covenant between God and man. As often as you drink, remember me. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for your sacrifice your love, for seeing us in a time of need and meeting us where we're at, for us to experience forgiveness from our sins and eternal life with you. Jesus, we recognize the work and the power that you displayed on the cross and we're forever thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've got a few more minutes to respond in worship. For some of us, it may just be sitting there and reflecting on what we've just heard and, and, and what God is speaking to us. For others, maybe it's a time to make a decision for Christ. Some of you need prayer, and we're gonna have opportunity down here underneath each of the screens to come and be prayed for. Maybe you need prayer and you wanna speak to the elders. It's immediately after this service, we're gonna have elder prayer upstairs. For the rest of us, I'm gonna invite us to respond through worship, through thanking God for all that he's just given to us, what he's speaking to us. So I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna to worship together. And, and I just say, man, let's blow the roof off this place. Let's pour our hearts out to who he is and let's celebrate his life together. So Lord, we again thank you for who you are and what you do. God, we are excited to worship you again this morning. God, we're gonna leave it all out for you. God, use us in a powerful way. Thank you for not letting us stay complacent, but for equipping us to do your work for your kingdom. Meet us here today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
Glad they came this morning. Yes. I love it when we can walk out of here feeling like we've got a challenge ahead of us. And that Ephesians verse that uh, Professor Cleve has assigned us is homework. Uh, I pray that you guys would take full advantage of that this week because we know that what we face is not flesh and blood. And so God wants to equip us. We need to be equipped to be prepared to be the people that he's gonna use this week. So let me pray you guys out of here. Lord, again, thank you for, your, for this time. God, thank you so much for your presence. God, your words that you spoke to us and the opportunity that we had to spend with you this morning. Now, God, allow us to, to take on the vision of reaching the world for, for you one person at a time this week. Use us in a powerful way. Thank you for your word and for equipping us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, real life. We'll see you next week.